This is Midweek Bible Study with Pastor Alan Dews. Good evening. Welcome back to Midweek Bible Study. Uh, tonight, we are continuing our study in the pastoral epistles, and we are beginning to look at the book of Titus. Last week, we finished 2 Timothy, uh, and in Titus, as he begins with his introduction, his greeting, his welcome, the Apostle Paul says something fascinating. He says, we are or he is God's ambassador, and so are we. Now, when I think about that word ambassador, it always remember, reminds me of an old story about uh, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. Uh, FDR, uh, as you know, was president longer than anyone else has been president of the United States and during World War II and dealing uh, with, uh, with so many other significant things. And so he had lots and lots and lots of interaction with people, with pe which he loved to do, but he had many, many, many parties and other things that he hosted at the White House. And on one of those occasions, he was just feeling exhausted and just getting tired of people. And he was in one of those long lines where people were coming in and he was greeting person after person after person after person. And finally, he'd had enough. And FDR began as people would come up and they would be overwhelmed to meet President Roosevelt and they would come up and greet him and he would give them that dazzling smile and he looked at someone and gave them that big smile and he said, last night I murdered my grandmother. And the person said, oh, President Roosevelt, it's so wonderful to meet you and I'm so glad to be able to be here and you're doing such a great job. Next person, last night. I murdered my grandmother. Oh, President Roosevelt, you're doing such a tremendous job. Keep up the good work. Next person was the ambassador from Lithuania. This man came up to President Roosevelt. President Roosevelt gave him that dazzling smile and said, last night I murdered my grandmother. The Lithuanian ambassador looked right, looked left, made eye contact with the president, smiled at him and said, I'm sure she deserved it. Ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Jesus. Paul says to Titus in Titus chapter 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Now, there's so much here in this verse, but the first thing that Paul emphasizes is, as God's ambassador, God is his and our absolute leader. Now the word Paul uses here for servant is the Greek word doulos. At that time it literally meant slave. Sometimes it's translated as slave in the New Testament. For instance, in 1 Peter 2.16, it says, Peter says, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Instead, live as God's slaves. Now, if you look in different translations here in Titus chapter 1, you will see that it is sometimes translated as servant, sometimes bond servant, sometimes as slave. Why? Because the word itself literally means slave, and, and, uh, and, and that word is used a lot in the Bible. Moses and Joshua were both as identified as servants or as slaves of God. In Romans and in Galatians, Paul calls himself a servant not of God, but of Christ or Jesus. Now, this is hard for us because when we think about slavery, we think in terms our paradigm is American slavery, which was hideous, and we all know that, and we all abhor that. And it was a form of absolute ownership of one human being owning another human being. And in Greek and Roman society, they practiced that form of slavery as well. But there were also multiple other levels, types of slavery that were a part of their society. We don't have time to go in and dissect all of that except to say that the word here, doulos, for servant or bondservant or slave, could certainly mean what we think of when we conceptualize slavery of absolute ownership. But it can also be very, very nuanced in different types of meanings, lest... Yeah, a, a, a graded type of approach uh, to what that meant in terms of, uh, of influence in the life of another individual. <clears throat> What's important here is that Paul doesn't care. Paul is absolutely okay with this absolute form of the word doulos, of this absolute form of this understanding of being God's 
servant or bond servant or slave. And, and it is his choice. He is God's servant. Look at this. He's God's servant by choice. He joyfully jumps in to being God's servant. God's his owner, his master, his absolute leader. He is not afraid to identify as God's servant with God as his leader. God is God. God is God. Now, he's going to be God whether we want him to be God or not, whether we acknowledge him as God or not. But God gives each one of us a choice about how we have relationship with him. What God wants, what God has done everything to restore is our relationship with him as his child. But he also wants for us to serve with him in partnership in building, accomplishing his purpose, his kingdom in the world. And Paul takes this identification as a servant. He takes something that is so extremely negative in his context and in ours, slavery, and he says, this is who I want to be. He says, it's awesome to surrender totally, completely, absolutely to God. This is who I am. God is my absolute leader. I trust him beyond anything. I want to serve and follow him with everything that I have. I don't want any inhibitions, any restrictions. I want you to understand that God, that God owns and controls everything about me. Yeah, I can take it back anytime I want to because God gives me that privilege and opportunity, but I don't want to because I love him so much and I trust him so much. He's my absolute leader. And he continues to say, and as an apostle, he is a messenger for Jesus. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the word apostle literally means messenger. The apostles were Jesus' chief messengers. But you and I are not apostles. So what does that mean for us? In what way are we called to be messengers for Jesus? Well, in John chapter 20, Jesus said, peace be with you. Now, he was, he's, he's, he's post-resurrection, getting ready for the ascension. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, God's messenger, so I am sending you. Now there's the role for us. We are Jesus' messengers. See, now a messenger is what? Someone who's sent with a message. Jesus sent his disciples as he was sent by God the Father. God sent him down from heaven with an incredible message of good news. Paul's identity was as an apostle. Our assignment is to be messengers for Jesus in the same way the Father sent Jesus. Jesus grew into his assignment. This is one of my favorite dimensions of this whole perspective. See, Jesus was sent from heaven by God, but he didn't immediately assume his responsibility as messenger, did he? I mean, he was born as a human baby. He was the son of God sent from heaven, but he was born as a human baby with this assignment to be the savior of the world. But he didn't do it immediately. He didn't do it in the cradle in Bethlehem. Every day, Jesus grew into this assignment. That gives me a lot of hope and a lot of courage. Every day, I choose by God's grace to become a more effective messenger for Jesus. I grow to be more like Jesus. I, I, I want to be more saturated with his spirit. I want to embrace his attitudes and his perspective. I want to see people through his eyes and feel their needs with his heart and care about them with his hands. Every day, you and I can show and care and demonstrate more of Jesus to one more person. We're God's messengers. And we build one another's faith. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect. See, your job and my job as a Christian, at least in part, is to further the faith of our fellow believers. How do you encourage my faith? How do I encourage your faith? Well, faith is like a spiritual muscle that needs to be developed. That means stress and damage and growth. How do you build muscles? You know, you think about going to the gym or doing other forms of exercise. How do muscles grow? Well, you build muscles, human muscles, by doing damage to the microfibers of the tissue, which then rebuilds itself stronger so that it can endure greater 
stress and offset further damage. So it's actually a good thing sometimes to incur stress and damage. That takes a little digestion, doesn't it? See, when our faith gets stretched to the breaking point, we usually respond by saying, God, how in the world, why in the world would you let this horrible thing happen to me? But what if God is allowing us to grow in our faith? See, stress and strain are necessary for growth. We help one another grow by modeling faith stretching attitudes and actions. When we're stretched and, and, and to the point that it, it tears and it hurts and, and, and we know that we may be sustaining some types of damage, then we model Christ most effectively when we lean into that and we embrace that and, and we allow God to use that to build our faith muscles, if we will. We go out on a limb for Jesus and trust him to heal us when the limb breaks and then we climb out on that tree again by faith and then we climb out on that tree again by faith. We build one another's faith. And see, it is faith, truth, that leads to godliness. Paul, and a servant of God and an apostle of Christ Jesus, to further the faith of God's elect, look, and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. See, godliness requires knowledge. I need to know who God is and, and, and the character that he wants me to have to, to really grow into godliness. But it, it must be knowledge of the truth, the whole truth, not this partial truth that is so commonplace. See, we are required to lead people from milk to meat spiritually. Information without application only leads to frustration. We need the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Most pastors get really concerned, even fearful about teaching really hard teachings. Why? Because it, it causes people to step back often or even to step away from faith. I know a lot of pastors are really concerned about teaching about money because it's a sensitive topic. But see, knowledge of the truth about God's expectation for our finances leads to godly stewardship. We're in a huge struggle in, in our generation regarding human sexuality. And many churches are completely surrendering biblical truth they're doing it often for some 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 good motivations why because living by the truth is really hard and they see how difficult that is in the lives of people but helping broken confused damaged people know and live the truth it, it can be painfully difficult causing pain is hard but causing pain isn't always bad you know, a few weeks ago, I, I had surgery. I literally paid this guy to cut my leg open. How crazy is that? But you know that we do that kind of thing. We pay a surgeon to, to do things like that, not to just cause ridiculous harm, but in order to repair damage that would not heal on its own. The Bible says the truth will set you free when you embrace the truth but it often requires replacing comfortable half-truth with uncomfortable total truth. Faith truth leads to godliness. But church, we as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are the bearers, the bringers of hope. Verse two, in the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. Paul is absolutely committed to God as an apostle. And he says the connection to Jesus Christ brings faith. It brings knowledge of the truth. I'm reiterating verse 1. Faith, knowledge of the truth. And this, here we are, results in hope of eternal life. You know, every time I, I, I conduct a funeral for a committed Christian, I grieve for the family, but I celebrate with the deceased the hope of eternal life. When I conduct a funeral for someone whose spiritual life is uncertain, it causes my hope to waver. See, we have hope in Christ Jesus. We are followers of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we can bring hope everywhere we go. Hope for eternal life. 
This is the ultimate hope. Sure, we have hope daily in, in regard to our faith in Jesus and our lives, that He is at work in our lives and in our world in ways we see and in ways we do not. But the ultimate hope is that when this life is over, and it will be for all of us, that we continue in relationship with Jesus forever. We offer hope. And our hope is based on God's promise. I have a lot of people who have made promises to me over the years. In our sanctuary here at Richfield, uh, we had a, uh, originally we had a shingle um, roof on the sanctuary here at Richfield. And that shingle roof that was put on uh, in it, about 20 years ago had a 25 year guarantee, but it only lasted about 10 years. Unfortunately, the manufacturer who guaranteed those shingles went out of business. So the promise that they made to guarantee those shingles was worthless. Our hope is based on God's promise. God's promise, His character is beyond reproach. His truth, He never lies, Paul says. He promised eternal life to followers of His Son before He created time. That is an absolute promise. Before anything came about, He promised us the hope of eternal life. Have you ever wondered about death and the promise of eternal life? See, that isn't a human creation. That is God's promise. And it is time, time for God's greatest good news. Look at verse 3. And which now, at His appointed season, He has brought to light, or brought His Word available through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. God's Word, the truth. That's literally what it says. In the fullness of time, Jesus came. Paul is shouting the good news to the world. The time for the Messiah is here. We are saved. The greatest news in the history of the world has come. The world feels crushed under the weight of the constant bad news that surrounds humankind and has throughout human history. But Jesus, God's word, his message of salvation has come. And we are invited and we must announce the good news of Jesus, which now is the appointed season he has brought to light his word through the preaching, notice, entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. We must. See, it's God's command that the message of Jesus be announced to the entire world. Jesus said, go into the world to every nation, and everywhere we go, we must announce the news about Jesus. Now, Paul was an absolute willing servant. Remember the beginning of what we talked about here? He had been commanded, but Jesus was the greatest good news that Paul himself had ever experienced personally. Jesus changed his life. Jesus changed my life. I bet he changed yours. He changed my darkness to light. He brought me hope. He showed me that faith in Jesus is everything. Other people or things may not be trustworthy, but Jesus is absolutely trustworthy. We have to tell people about Jesus. And this message is for us. Verse 4, to Titus, my true son, in our common faith. Now, I just love this. See, we are God's true children. Titus is not a Jewish name. Titus is a Greek name. Paul, the Jewish apostle of Jesus, said Titus, the Greek man, was his true son in their shared faith in Jesus. See, the Jews didn't own Jesus. He was a Jew, but they didn't own him. Nazarenes, the church of the Nazarene, doesn't own Jesus. People of every race or creed don't own Jesus. Jesus, he is the savior for every human being. Every Christian from every tribe or every nation is my brother or my sister in Christ. You know, uh, the Church of the Nazarene has, has churches and work in more than 178 countries around the world, but we're only one Christian denomination. There are Christians everywhere. We may not completely agree about everything with all our brothers and sisters, but we're united as a family through the blood of Jesus. Our first uh, Nazarene general superintendent was fond of saying, in essentials, we as a church have unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity, which is the old word for love. In all things, we show love to one another. See, the message for Jesus is for all of us. In the essentials, we persevere on living and focusing together. But we have a lot of room 
to love brothers and sisters. We belong to Jesus and one another. You can yell at me, you can be frustrated with me, you can disagree with me, but you can't get rid of me because I'm your brother in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, I'm your brother. Our faith unites us through Jesus. Now, I like the other meaning of common, my true son in our common faith. Common means uh, our, our shared faith here, but it also means ordinary or plain. So you don't have to be wealthy or beautiful or brilliant to belong to Jesus. Our faith is common. It's attainable by everyone. I came to Jesus as a child. We must regularly remind one another to remove every barrier that exists between people and Jesus. We often create what one man called stained glass barriers. And the only barrier that should exist between anyone and Jesus is the cross. We want this message to be shared with everyone because it's ours. It belongs to us. So Paul says, therefore, greet and bless everyone in the name of God. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now, grace and peace was Paul's common way of greeting and blessing those to whom he wrote. And it was a combination of the Hebrew shalom, peace, and the Greek grace to you, which were common greetings and blessings in the letter of letters of that period. But Paul elevated this from either grace or peace, and he blended it into this beautiful Christian greeting and blessing when he combined them both. You know, when one of my friends here at church texts me a good morning, brother, or I love you, my brother, it warms my heart. And when I hear I'm praying for you or God bless you, brother, it warms my heart. It means so much more when it comes from a Christian brother or sister whose source for that blessing is the love of God. See, when you're grounded in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, your words have God's guarantee behind them. Paul's grace, Paul's peace was from the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. When we speak with Jesus within us, we bless with Jesus beside us. Your prayer, your blessing, even your greeting as a follower of Jesus carries the voice of God through you. We are his ambassadors of faith and hope and eternal life. What an amazing privilege is ours. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, so much for the privilege we have to be your sons and daughters, to be your servants, to be your ambassadors of your incredible love and good news in this world. I pray your blessing on each of us together, Lord, that we may be more effective as your ambassadors this week. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining me. Have a great week.